Hello, and welcome to this episode of the ASHA Podcast. I'm Fred Wine with the American Sexual Health Association, ASHA. We're talking today with a very special guest, Eve McDavid, a Google strategy executive who was diagnosed with stage 2B cervical cancer under some pretty special circumstances. So Eve, first, thank you for stopping by and taking some time to share your story with us. Fred, thank you so much for having me and thank you to everyone at ASHA as well. I'm so appreciative of the opportunity and the platform to have this conversation with you today. Well, I, I and I'm especially happy because I just cannot wait to jump in and talk about your story. It's so amazing. So you, you, were, uh, you are a high-flying tech professional and as I understand it, in January, 2020, you were diagnosed with cervical cancer and that happened to be one month before you were scheduled to deliver your, expected to deliver your second child. And of course, two months before COVID shut down pretty much the whole country. Um, I mean, any one of those by itself would be like a life-changing event, but to have them all at the same time, I, I just can't even imagine. So I do wanna talk about your diagnosis and your treatment and how you coped with it, but I've gotta ask, how did you cope with a cervical cancer diagnosis a month before you're due to deliver a baby with a global pandemic erupting around you? Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, it was profoundly difficult, near impossible. Uh, I will tell you, the experience of a cancer diagnosis, the experience of a cervical cancer diagnosis, particularly at a time when I was so vulnerable during pregnancy, uh, and then to go through this really sort of confusing and overwhelming experience in becoming a cancer patient instead of becoming, well, at the same time as I was becoming a new mom, but not really feeling like that was part of my experience, uh, was sort of something where you <laughs> your spirit separates from your body. <laughs> And you just do whatever you can to do to cling on and to take one step at a time. Uh, I'll tell you, I, I truly spent most of 2020 in shock and certainly the early uh, months of the year that experience was profound. Uh, it, it took the incredible devotion and dedication of my husband who he is a mental health professional. He's a clinical psychotherapist and he put his practice on hold to care for me, to take me to every treatment, to every appointment. Uh, in the early days, he was coordinating my patient record and all scans and resources to secure second opinions. I mean, he really ran the functional structure of what it means to see someone through a diagnosis. Uh, and he acted in that capacity before I was able to get there myself. Um, eventually, you know, I, I came back online uh, and I, I, you know, I, I stepped in and uh, I, I really um, focused on treatment. And those next couple months were subsumed with going to treatment, spending time with my son and my toddler. I have a little girl as well, who's now four and a half and um, really just trying to survive. And that was before COVID, right? And so of course, uh, when, when COVID hit and New York City became the epicenter, uh, the way I sort of describe my experience in care is that I began treatment during peacetime where I was showing up to someone else's job for a change. And I was watching my incredible care team you know, perform life-saving efforts every single day in their own type of calm that they approach the job. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, everything changed with COVID where the hospital became a really frightening place, not just for patients, but also for physicians and the entire healthcare staff and system that supports it. And so it really was a once in a lifetime experience that I look at and think, holy cow, I just can't believe that that all went on. And I'm here today talking to you about what it means to get through that. You know, my next question was going to be, I, didn't, I don't want to make this a COVID discussion per se, but I was going to ask you, Dina, tell us about your treatment. How did COVID complicate it? And yeah. you just hit a big one there. It made the hospital a terrifying place to be. 
Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. You know, it was it was so fascinating because of everything that I just described and, you know, how, you know, as a patient, you find trust and solace and reassurance in a really calm staff who has seen something like your diagnosis before and has already gone through the rhythms of carrying women through this. Uh, and to understand, you know, in a very, very short window of time, you know, we're calm, we're not too concerned about this to all of a sudden, this is a global public health crisis and everyone around us is sick and we don't know what this looks like and we don't know what this will become. To be newly immunocompromised was also a new identity for me, right? Um, I'm someone, I, you know, I can't even remember the last time I had the flu before I had cancer. That's how uh, hardy a person I, I am. And, you know, all of a sudden my my treatment that was saving my life now put me at risk for another really existential threat. And no one, you know, myself nor my care team really knew what that meant for me. Um, but we did know, you know, what we did know was that as soon as I was done with treatment, it was important for us to leave the city and get to a lower density area. And prior to that, my care team made every effort successfully to keep my care on track. Uh, you know, in conversations you may have had with other women who've described the treatment process for cervical cancer, your clock starts for eight weeks of treatment and you have eight weeks to get an enormous amount of intensive care in. And after eight weeks, any therapeutics that are administered beyond that point for the first line treatment, um, women see a precipitous drop in survival rates and recur and increase in recurrence rates. And so my doctors, you know, looked at my care and my progress, my tremendous progress that I was making through treatment. And they decided to hold the line and to continue with the protocol that had been established for my standard of care. Uh, and I, I say this with deep humility because I know intimately that other patients care was paused during this time and mine sure. not mine continued um so there were there were many just-in-time miracles that occurred on my journey to <laughs> make it through this and uh, and that is one of them that you know there was no compromise to my care uh and i mean frankly that's i look back on that now and i just think that is one of the most remarkable stories out of all of this it sounds like it yeah that's um that's a lot to take in because it's, it's like, you know, you're, you're, you're worried about yourself. You're, I mean, you've got a cervical cancer diagnosis, but you're worried about your pregnancy. You're worried about your loved ones trying to support you. And I don't even know if they could come into the hospital, that kind of thing. Uh, so they're just, it's just challenge on top of challenge uh, that you had to, had to navigate there. Um, let me ask you about this just to switch gears a little bit. I want to ask you about the human papillomavirus, HPV. And of course, HPV, there are many different strains and a certain number of high-risk strains are the ones that cause virtually all cases of cervical cancer. And for a lot of the folks we talk with, that's, you know, they had never heard about HPV before. They don't understand its connection with cervical cancer. I'm just curious, did, had you ever heard of HPV? Did you know anything about it? What, what kind of questions did that bring up for you? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, I think the human papillomavirus is so central to this conversation and it's so poorly understood. And so I love that we're spending time on it because it's it's so incredibly important. So I'll tell you, I knew a bit about the human papillomavirus. Uh, I had the human papillomavirus HPV as early as I began cervical cancer screening after becoming sexually active as a young adult. Um, I was, uh, I think, 19 years old when I was diagnosed with HPV, and I knew nothing about it. I'd heard about it in public school health education, uh, but there was no connection to cervical cancer. And most interestingly, I don't recall a connection to the pap test and screening. And so when I received this diagnosis, um, you know, you feel like you're, you're blown against the wall. Like, is this 
really yeah. bad? Is this really scary? Is this something to be ashamed of? Is this something to be frightened about? Yeah. Do I have to talk about this? How do I disclose this? What do I do with this information? And there was no real guidance around that dialogue this was 15 years ago, right? And I'll say even today, as I've stepped out and started to talk about my story and what it means to responsibly manage an HPV infection, which almost every person who's been sexually active has come in contact with HPV exactly. has it, right? Um, managing an HPV infection, we should actually think about that as a really healthy way to go through life, that it's part of our healthcare management and how we show up to care and something that we can be comfortable talking about with our providers because we have it and our providers likely have it too. And the fact that that is not part of the public dialogue is a real gap and a real shame here. And it's something that I think in my work, we'll spend a lot of time talking about because cervical cancer is a relatively rare outcome of an HPV infection. But again, HPV is basically the common cold of sexually transmitted infections. Yeah. Preach. Thank you for saying all <laughs> that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, yeah. What, that's exactly how we describe HPV. It's the common cold of, of sexually transmitted infections. I mean, uh, one of our lines is, do you know what it means if you have HPV? It means you're normal. You're human, you know, yeah. and you're exactly right. You know, the majority of cases of HPV aren't, aren't dangerous. They tend to clear naturally. Most people never know they have it, but it absolutely can increase risk for cervical and some other cancers too. That's why, you know, all this, the, the, you mentioned the screening tests and all that. We'll get into that a little more in a bit, but that's why those are so important. Um, and you actually touched on a bit of the next question I was going to ask. I mean, we develop a lot of resources, you know, like practical tips and tools for, for patients, not only to help them understand the clinical side of things, the tests are going to have, the terminology, that kind of thing, but also the emotional relationship coping kind of side of it. Um, and so I was going to ask about your tips. I mean, what are some things you wish you would have known when you started this journey or maybe things you figured out along the way? That made it a little bit easier. And you talked about the importance of understanding and discussing HPV for one thing. Uh, I would say there are, you know, the um, the emotional and the psychological safety tips, right? And then there are the actual functional tips. What does what does a, a woman do uh, to manage her care and make sure that if she has HPV? and is at risk for developing cervical cancer, then she knows how to create a plan with her provider based on her risk factors to prevent cervical cancer because cervical cancer is preventable, especially when it's detected early, which we can do. So the tips, okay. From an emotional and psychological safety standpoint, I would start by saying, or really echoing what you just said. If you have HPV, you are normal. I think the number one thing that prevents us from accessing care, even when we are fortunate enough to have the resources to do so, is to be able to talk about it. I think that the shame that we carry and the confusion due to the misunderstanding of what it means to have something that is so normal and is frankly a, you know, a a sort of standard consequence of sexual activity, right? Just as there are risks and consequences with uh, just about any activity. Uh, this is something that it's important to know is real, know is normal, and know that you can use your voice to ask for help. Very good. Yeah, that's it. And uh, finding the voice, you know, you mentioned the, the shame and stigma, and that's an impediment to somebody finding their voice a lot of times. Um, yeah, exactly. Well, let me let me go in another direction. This so that's something on the patient side. What about with uh, the healthcare providers? You know, we also develop a lot of resources for providers to try and uh, you know just you know, to help them have better interactions with the patients and patient counseling things. What, what advice would you have for healthcare providers as they're interacting with patients along the continuum, 
continuum of cancer care, how can they do a better job or just make something more welcoming or maybe a little bit easier? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great question. And the first thing I'll say is that having, you know, worked in this space for uh, the last you know, I would say almost a year now that I've, I've really started to dig into what does it mean to talk about this? What does it mean to work with providers to start to look for the right solutions here? This is a really welcoming community that is hungry for change. Uh, I hear the way that providers respond to me when I share my story with them and my experience and the looks on their faces when they realize how much additional burden a woman experiences because of the shame surrounding cervical cancer uh, is probably troublesome for them and they carry it with a heavy heart. And so I, I say this to, you know, the listeners right now to just know that this is a field that's searching for change as well. And I think that there's a really interesting patient and provider partnership that will help evolve the way that all of us go through this together. Um, from a provider standpoint, I'll say this as well, though, a patient's ability to find a trusted relationship and someone with whom they feel comfortable not only discussing these really challenging topics, but also the physicality of what it means to go in for an exam. We're talking about a gynecological exam that may be difficult or triggering based on a woman's previous experiences, either with care providers or in her own personal history that are all coming to the fore in the exam room. And for the 15 to 20 minutes that we get with our providers, it's really difficult to sort of deal with what's running in the background of everything that we're bringing into this experience. And then the want of what we both want to accomplish in the 20 minutes or so that we have together. And there's a lot that gets lost in the intensity of that time period. And so what I would say is use your intuition and trusted recommendations from people you know or other ways that you are able to vet your providers and find someone you feel really comfortable with in both this physical and behavioral care experience. Uh, and you know we, we need that. And the more providers who lean into that identity with their patients, I think the more transparency and directness and actual you know, care and problem solving will occur in that really, really important time period in an annual exam every year. So we've touched on the patient experience and obviously providers. Let me ask you about family members because they yeah. sometimes get overlooked in all of this. Uh, and, and you mentioned, you know, um, you know, uh, earlier about the important role your, your husband played with in, in your situation. And I always like to give the family a shout out. So <laughs> Let me ask you about their needs. So, I mean, just from what you saw, not only not only your husband, you know, your you know, you know, your extended family. You know, they all go through this. What could we do to maybe better support and prepare family members when their loved one is diagnosed with cervical cancer? Yeah, that's a, a really important question because the experience for the woman at the center is so isolating, and whatever experience she's had with her family surrounding sexual health and sexual education also comes to the fore. How comfortable is a woman talking about gynecologic care, gynecologic cancer treatment, gynecologic cancer treatment recovery with the people she's closest to? And I will say very honestly, not every family is prepared to support that dialogue in an honest way. And it's a real shame. There were a number of times during my experience where, and I, I say this again with so much humili humility, I wondered if I would have felt more confident and less ashamed if I'd been diagnosed with a different disease. Mm. And that is such a impossible, unrealistic and confounding experience when you're already battling for what you hope is your survival. And so it's very important for a family to understand that this is a experience that changes a woman. Everything that she knows about herself in her 
aftermath of this experience will be different. And so my message to families is take a minute, let everyone take deep breaths, let everyone think a little bit about what their ability to participate both in the short and medium and long term of this journey looks like, and then ask the woman who is diagnosed, what do you need during this time and how may we support you? How may we accommodate around what you need and let that guide the conversation in a family? Yeah, it just really all seems to get back to dialogue, having conversations and just you know, just simply asking what, what do you need or, or saying this is what I need. It's easier said than done, but yeah, I, I, I like the way you, you lay it out there. Um, so one of the thing that things I find so heartbreaking about cervical cancer is that, you know, as you've alluded to, you know, it's, it's at this point, it's largely preventable um, through vaccination. And then we also have wonderful screening tests that at least mean, you know, if, if someone is being screened regularly that uh, any, any disease will probably be caught early when it's very treatable and manageable. Um, so it's so frustrating that we have these great tools and we just don't always utilize them. Um, you have a lot of street cred, both as a mom and as a survivor. So let me ask you, what would you say to parents and young adults about getting vaccinated to prevent uh, not only cervical cancer, but a number of other HPV associated cancers. Absolutely. And I love the street card I carry. So I'm going <laughs> to lean do. into that right now. <laughs> so as a mom, I'll tell you, you know, I watched what this experience was like for my daughter. She was two and a half at the time that I was diagnosed. And I thought really critically about this because I myself have childhood memories that date to just about before uh, the age she was when I was diagnosed. And it was this really powerful moment of, oh my goodness, what is this like for my daughter? What is like, what is happening to her life right now? And in many ways, that single question became a thread that I started pulling on and pulling on and pulling on and became the stream of a tremendous amount of personal and professional work that I embarked on in my recovery to ultimately be the type of woman and mom. I owed it to her and to my son to become in the aftermath of this if I was so lucky to survive. And, and I, I, I was. And so, you know, I'll say that the things that we do with our children have today have lasting impact. Mm -hmm. What we do now matters 10, 20, 30 years from now. 40 years from now, the entire span of their lifetime and what they then pass on to their children. And so we as parents have an obligation to do the right thing for our children now and give them every opportunity to live a long and fulfilled life that is not cut short by preventable cancer. And I know there's a lot of divide on this issue. And so I'll change hats from being a mom to being a tech executive and talk about the research and the science and the data that's behind 20 years of effectiveness of the HPV vaccine. I think of a really inspiring conversation I had with Dr. Maria Trent, who is the chief of adolescent medicine at Johns Hopkins University. And she said to me, she said, we have, we have 20 years of evidence that this works. And I can tell you as a practicing physician, we don't see the cases of cervical cancer that we were seeing 20 years ago because we have a vaccine that prevents this. And I look at that, I look at research that's just come out of the UK that demonstrates where women who are who were vaccinated before they became sexually active. So between the ages of nine and 13, the rates of cervical cancer among that cohort dropped 90%. And so the bets that you're making today have ramifications 30 years from now. And we should care about that. We should care about leaving this world a little bit better than how we arrived into it and giving our kids the HPV vaccine is one 
science-backed way to do that. And, you know, it's not just about cervical cancer. Uh, you know, HPV is associated with a number of cancers and, and the vaccine is approved to prevent, you know, most of them. I mean, you've got uh, uh, head and neck cancer, certain types of head and neck cancers, anal cancers, vulgar, uh, vulvar and vaginal cancers. Um, there are a lot of different cancers out there. And it's something really, and, it, and it, this is not even a gender issue, regardless yeah. of gender, the HPV vaccine is recommended It's and it works, you know, I mean, and you're exactly right. There's, there's excellent data. And one thing, you know, I heard, heard somebody say, do you know what childhood vaccines cause adults? So, you know, there you go. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, and Fred, I will, I will build on that and say, we now have an opportunity that is so different because of COVID, meaning that as a population, I think we have an understanding of what it means to talk about a virus and the public health implications in a way that the layperson understands. And I look at COVID and everything that we've seen the world mobilize around. And I think, well, so much of what we've learned here is applicable in HPV. And it's exactly what you just said. It's indicated for people of all genders in childhood before they are sexually active. So, you know, between the ages of right. nine and 13 is when it's indicated. And as my oncologist says, she says, when you protect your son, you're protecting your daughter. And so we want to make sure that anyone who could become vulnerable or at risk for developing any HPV related cancer, which to your point affects both men and women is protected. And we also want to reduce community spread. We wanna make sure that when folks are sexually active, when that time eventually comes, right? When that time eventually comes, they have protection from an incredibly deadly virus that doesn't have to have any effect on them if they have that prior protection and prior immunity. And that's a very, very, very important consideration because of course we don't wanna have to talk about sex with our kids before they're ready for it, right? I think about my kids and I think about where they are right now. And, you know, my daughter hears cervical all the time in my household mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, okay, so at what, you know, she knows that the cervix is part of a girl's anatomy, a woman's anatomy. And so at what point are we going to have to talk about sex? And that's a real consideration. And I, I don't diminish that at all. And you don't have to talk about sex to give your kids a vaccine. You can decouple that and get to the talk that you want to have about sex on the appropriate timetable for you and your child when it's right for you. It does not have to be a conversation about whether you also deserve to have a vaccine for protection years from now. Yeah, and I like your point about giving the vaccine early. I, I, it's approved for both genders ages nine through 26. Actually, you can get it out through age 45 now, but the focus is primarily on nine through 26. But when you give it earlier, as early as age nine, you're right, you're getting protection in place before uh, someone becomes sexually active. So. Yeah, and you also mentioned earlier that, you know, what we do now has an impact on our kids, you know, 30, 40, who knows how many years down the road. And that's the thing with the vaccine, by giving them the vaccine now, you're getting that protection in place for when they need it down the road so that they don't develop these cancers 10, 20, 30 years down the road. That's it, exactly. Um, exactly. You know, women in my generation, I'll say I'm, I'm in my 30s. I had the vaccine in my 20s. I was already sexually active. I already had an HPV infection. And so it wasn't as effective. And so I'm talking with women in my generation right now, many of whom are in my exact same category. And they're saying, okay, I know that, you know, I still have these potential risk factors and I have to track this, but I'm also coming to the point where my kids are going to be eligible. And now I understand what it means to give them this coverage before all of this. So right. for all the concerns you as a parent have, you don't have to worry about this one. There you go. So let me, let, let me touch on your professional life. So uh, yes. you know, as I mentioned, you're a strategy executive with Google 
and a femtech entrepreneur. So tell us about your work. And I'm sure there's an angle there with your surgical cancer advocacy. <laughs> right, you are. That's right. Yeah. So, you know, we talked a little bit about how I coped with so much all at once. And uh, I'm, I'm very interested to hear what the feedback from our listeners will be, because I think some folks will hear this and say, oh my goodness, this woman is really out there. Um, but I, you know, I'll, I'll share a little bit about my background and sort of how I got into this space. Of course, my diagnosis really was the catalyst, right? Um, but what prompted me to take a closer look and want to stay involved? And that I think is a really important consideration because again, given the you know tremendously overwhelming experience, this is a disease that it is much easier to shut the door on and walk away from and never want to talk about ever again. And in my experience, I thought, well, gee, all I see are opportunities to improve this. So like, where do I get started? Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I realized that is not, you know, the, the average response. And so, you know, I, I say, you know, to anyone who goes through this in any which way, you've done the right thing just by taking care of yourself and, and being able to wake up every day. Um, you know, my, my background has been in technology and media and business for the last 15 years. And I've been very fortunate to have an incredible career at Google. And it has been a place that has inspired me to see opportunities and openings and complex problem solving that I never would have understood or experienced or had the capacity to apply to another space like cervical healthcare otherwise. Um, my, my roles have been working to introduce new technologies to industries and demonstrate how by using either people as a function, products as a function, or processes as a function can all help improve an existing system and new technology is really at the core of that. And so I've worked across most uh, most of private industry and most recently across the public sector. Um, and uh, what has been really exciting is that in 15 years, we've seen a really nascent kind of like shiny cool object in marketing become yeah. the way that we communicate primarily. I mean, look at us right now. We're talking to each other through screens, something that, you know, never we would consider, you know, maybe just a few years ago, right? Uh, and so, uh, you know, understanding technology's power to transform an industry, an environment, a system uh, has always been very, very core to uh, my professional experience. And so when I had this diagnosis and I was in shock and I was unavailable to my family because treatment is so consuming and so overwhelming. And I was not well, I was postpartum and I was, you know, in a frenzy of life changes all at once, right? There's cancer treatment, there's menopause, there's infertility, there's the physical and mental health fallout that occurs after treatment. I mean, it is like, you know, and all of this is in just a few months time, you go through a lifetime of life events all at once. And, you know, you sort of wonder, like, what will be left of me on the other side? And so I, I started to wonder, you know, like, who else goes through this? What does this look like? And who else in the world is talking about this? And I made two very important observations. Uh, the first was that I could not find a woman in my professional network who was talking about cervical health care. Uh, and I, I, you know, I, I looked extensively. Uh, I, I found incredible stories of women bravely talking about their experiences on YouTube. Uh, I came across really powerful organizations like ASHA and like Survivor that have made it much easier for women to speak out about this. Uh, and still, I didn't see any women's leaders talking about cervical health care, talking about the PAP test, talking about the HPV vaccine. I, I thought like, gee whiz, like before I even knew about anything related to gynecological care, I'd heard about the PAP test when I was a teenager. So like, where is a woman's leader talking on a platform about the importance of something that is so central to women's health care? It is just non-existent. And so I looked at this background that I had in 
in technology and also like dabbling in, you know, product evangelism. You can tell I'm very comfortable on a stage. I'm very comfortable with the yeah. mic, right? And Absolutely. I thought I can be a woman in tech who has just gone through this unbelievable experience that again is a relatively rare outcome of an incredibly common experience. And I can start talking about it and I can just see what happens. And the response has been unbelievable. And I have to say, like, you know, sometimes I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm talking about an SDD on social media on a professional platform like LinkedIn. Like, what, are you, like, what is this? What am I doing? What do? Yeah, exactly. Like, how did I get here? You know? Uh, and I think, hell yes, right? Like, yes, you know, like, hell yes. Right? Exactly, exactly, exactly. So that is one, one work stream that I think is so important is making this topic accessible and something that you can call up your girlfriend or your sister, or your mom or your aunt and you say, hey, I'm going to get screened today. I'm due for my pap test. I'm due for a vaccine. Have you done this recently? What do I need to know about this? And can you help calm my nerves? I want to make that conversation that we have among loved ones, among the women we love in our lives, so easy so that we can take away the fear of everything else that may or may not follow in her journey. And I very, very much believe that that is possible with public dialogue. We've got PAP tests, we have HPV tests, we have HPV vaccines, and we have people like you who are talking. Will you give me one more hell yes? Let's do it on three. <laughs> one, two, three. Hell, hell yes. <laughs> That's right. I mean, and Frank, that brings me to my second observation here was that we have nothing but solutions and nothing but breakdown in this system. I thought if you look at prevention, screening, treatment, and recovery, who is the chief executive that oversees that entire system? Whose job is it to care about how a woman goes through this care continuum that begins at 20, 21 years old and goes through age 65, at least depending on her sexual activity, who is helping her through that journey and who understands all the ins and outs of it. And that's where I get really excited about the potential of modern technology. When you look at the point solutions in so much of this cervical healthcare experience for women, a lot of this technology is very, very dated. The HPV vaccine is new in the last 20 years, but the PAP test, for example, is pretty similar to what it looked like in the 1950s when it was first introduced in a widespread way, right? The tools that are used in radiation procedures, brachytherapy, it's internal radiation that's part of standard of care, those are from the 1970s, and their actual design dates back to Marie Curie's discovery of radium before the turn of the 20th century. Wow, so we're talking about a care system that is maybe a century old that women are interfacing with without information, without confidence, with a lot of shame, and without the best that modern technology has to bear. And so my mission in the technical projects that I'm scoping to advance the solutions and streamline care and make care more accessible, my mission is to have cervical health care reflect in a safe way the best of modern technology. And I believe that women's outcomes will forever be improved if the technology that we use in our marketing tools, right? In the advertising tools that you use to get the message out about this podcast, right? If the level of sophistication that we used in some of that technology were reflective in the care experience that women have. I believe all women deserve that and I'm on a mission to make that possible. And we have to make sure that, that all these patients understand what these tests do and why they're having them. Because yeah, you're right. There's the PAP test. As I mentioned, there's an HPV test, which finds the virus itself. Sometimes you have one without the other. Sometimes you have them together. You know, it, there's, there's, the communication piece really, really is huge. So 
Absolutely. And, you know, Fred, too, I'll say there is incredible innovation happening in this space. And that's what gets me so excited is that I looked around to who was working on this and I'm not the only one, right? Like there's an enormous body of work and an incredible group of people globally who are experts in the fields of public health and gynecological health, and they are committed to eradicating cervical cancer. The WHO has developed an elimination initiative and is committed to eradicating this disease. And so when I look at you know, the way groups are using artificial intelligence to improve screening and open up access to care. Um, when I look at the way um, startups are improving the recovery experience and making it more humane and data-driven, I am so energized by all the great thought leadership that's happening. We just need to talk about it. We need to help women understand that this is an incredible asset. Your cervical health is an incredible asset to own, protect, and maintain through the course of your lifetime. And there will be incredible solutions to help you do that. Eve McDavid, you're a marvel. I mean, it takes so much strength and energy to navigate cancer. And when you had everything else you had going on on top of it, so much, so much respect now to you. I mean, th thank you for taking your time to share your story and your insights to others who might be walking that that Pat, you're the best. Thank you. Fred, thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure. And you can read more about Eve on her website, evemcdavid.com. So thanks to everybody who streams this episode. We appreciate you too. You check back with us often. We're going to have a lot of things we're rolling out. So we will see you next time. And we'll put the link to Eve's website in the show notes, show notes as well. All right. Until next time, take care, everybody.